And McGuinness, he walked into this shop. So I walked in. Had there been operators, they'd have killed half of them people and got away. But they were admin guys and they'd taken the wrong turn at a funeral. When they got shot, the, the, the wound wouldn't get infected with, with cloth. He was stripped and put in the room and taken away and returned to unit. But he was a, he was a SBS. Martin, good to see you, brother. And you, sir. Oh, just been reading know, about the. I've got a big thing. Yeah, I've just been reading about the endur it. endurance course, and it brings back uh, memories, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, um, before we go any further, I'm just going to say some keywords because apparently that helps us on YouTube. They hear you say a few keywords in the first sentence. Right. It helps up up your rating. So we're talking here. Former Royal Marines Commando. Yeah. What SF were you in, Martin? I, w was 14 inch. 14 inch. So yeah. serving in the Northern Ireland conflict. Undercover. Yes. Uh, can we say child, child abuse? Um, child abuse and sexual abuse in the Marines. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk all about this, aren't we? And, yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and start getting a conversation going about some of these important areas of life that a lot of people, you know, want to sweep under the carpet. Yep. I think I bet the Royal Marines wish they could sweep Jimmy Savile under the carpet, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> and then self-made multi-millionaire. Yep. I think this is going to be a good podcast. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. So I've got on the bottom of my notes... Talk, Uncle Albert, talk. Yes. Yes. Because <laughs> exactly. that's what they all called me, my kids. Yeah. What happened in the war? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I joined up, mate. Because do, do, what, what year did you leave mine? I left in 78. Oh, that's, that's probably, yeah, I... I Sorry, I stopped tripping over my words. I joined up for a bet. So right. I, was, I was homeless and living in my Renault 12. Right. Albeit temporary homelessness, but still not nice to experience when you're 17, you know. Kick, no. Nope. Kicked out of home for the second time at 17. Right. Um, and that's a, a whole weird experience. Being homeless. Fucking hell. Yeah. The first time, I think I was 14, 15, homeless in your school uniform. is Something ain't right there, right? Hey, Chris, Chris, read the book. Yes. I, 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 I was homeless at 14 in Liverpool. Yes. No, I, was, I did the same, mate. Yes. I ran away for two weeks. I will just say that what, uh, from, from yeah. the little bit I've managed to read so far, what a really well-written book, folks, and... Um, there's a few duffers out there, let's say, but this certainly isn't one of them. But yeah, so there I was, homeless in the Renault 12. My mate comes up, knocks on the window. He says, I've just passed the Royal Marines potential recruit course. You could never do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, you don't tell, you know, a trauma experience of what they can and cannot do no. because, because they might not be able to control everything in the past but they can control to a degree their future and we we don't like being told what we can and can't do it am i right there mine absolutely spot on yeah so i ended up on the prc it's now called the prmc for people who are wondering um and at one point we had to do the endurance course but we did it in light order and we didn't do the run back. We did like a mile of it. Right. And as I was <coughs> running up that heathland and it's up, down, in it, up, down, through the water tunnels, through the sheep dip, freaking hell, real savage. And I started to fall back. And two things there. 
first of all, I w- I couldn't drop out, Martin. I could not. No. I no. could not fail. Because I didn't want my parents having the satisfaction of going, there you go, we told you you went, you know. <coughs> and 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 the other thing there was the Royal Marines Corporal, I'm guessing he was a corporal, PTI or something, dropped back and went, Are you right, fella? I went, Yeah, I'm, I'm knackered, Corporal. <laughs> so don't you worry about that. In the Royal Marines, we ain't looking for supermen. We're looking for blokes just like you, blokes that don't give up. I thought that was a real special thing he said to me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So how did you, you, were you in the Navy first, did I gather? No, no, I was in the sea cadets. Ah, okay. And I went to join the Navy, and as I was sat in the recruitment, this big colour sergeant walked in and said, would you like to be a Marine? Commando. And I said, well, I thought you had to get picked. He said, well, I'm picking you. So that was it. I was 16, I think. Yes. And what was that then? Was that recruiting office? Did you have to do some pull-ups and stuff? Yeah. I mean, I, I, the reason you went, you were homeless, I went to get away from my abuse from my father. That's, that's, I was a very, very talented artist. And I wanted to go to art school and the Royal Academy had accepted me. But I had to get away from... Uh, the home. So that's why I joined and then uh, went to deal as a junior Marine. And you don't have to, you know, dip in too deep or you just tell me to fuck off, whatever, it doesn't matter. No. But w- was your dad getting physical with you? Uh, well, I, it ended up that I was bleeding. My black back used to bleed with the fishing rod. I used to have to take my shirt off. Um, and my mother made me wait at home in the parlour with no heating when I was eight because I'd been caught doing something at school, something silly, and I waited in the corner from four to eleven with no heating, no food, and I used to piss myself so I wasn't allowed to go to the toilet and then sent to bed and my father used to drive on the motorbike, and it, you used to hear him wheezing up the stairs and taking his belt off. And I just prayed it was the strap and not the buckle end. But mostly it was the buckle end. And my brother used to stand in front of him. Um, but it, it didn't stop. Then it went on to a fishing rod with the eyes in. I used to jump in the bath, or I'm told to have a bath. And the water was literally pink. With blood, yeah, it was fucking abusive. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm I, it still it still gets to me now. For sorry, hey, no apology needed, mate. No apology needed, and I, I think there'd probably be people surprised to hear this. But as I say to everybody, the seventies was well. I mean, I was growing up in the seventies. I'm guessing you were ten years before me, but yeah. Even in the 70s, it was a really abusive time. Yeah. You know, any adult back then could beat you as a kid. Any. Yeah. I, I know it sounds weird, but you could be, walk- I mean, I remember times walking down the street, some adult just come over, smack you around the head, right? Yeah. Yeah. For spitting or something. Yeah. 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 Or it would turn out that someone had like cherry knocked their door or something. And they just walked along and just picked you to, you know, maybe they got the person wrong or whatever it was. Um, And I remember, you know, in in school, teachers were just allowed to get physical with you. And and now if they did, if they did now what they did to us back then, and certain kids in particular got singled out. I used to get the cane virtually every day for some silly thing. And if they were really, when I look at what kids do today, they were silly little things. Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh. You know, some of the things that went on, if they did it today, they'd be looking at like five years in prison. Absolutely right. You know, they, they, they honestly, honestly would. So, But that's why half the profits are going to vulnerable children in any shape or form. I don't mind. Yes. Good. What was the name of that? charity 
is I'm I'm actually keeping the money in a pot and looking because me and Teresa help people. We've helped the people all our lives, and we look at suitable candidates, if you like, and we personally look after them. Yeah. So that's it's not going to a big charity, Chris. Okay. No, no, no. That that that's brilliant. Do you know a guy called Julian? Called who? Sorry, Julian. Julian, ex, ex marine. He's he's about your age. He's living up in Scotland at the moment. Yeah. Did Mental you say? Health. Did you say Julian? Like, um, yeah. He does a lot for uh, does a lot of marathons and things. Oh, we 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 might have crossed on the old internet or something, but yeah. Because we're looking after him at the moment. I make sure he's all right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, good. We're, we can promote anything that you like, or any links you want to send us. Obviously, we'll put a link for the book underneath this video. Um, so there you are. You, you're trying to get out of home. You end up in the, in the Marines. Yeah. What, what, what was Limston like back then? Was It, it was Limston, right? Well, we did deal first as a junior Marine. Ah, that's right, yeah. yeah. And then we went to Limston, uh, which, like you, I used to have asthma. And like you, that corporal, I, I was going on a run and I had an asthma attack. And he stopped me, Sergeant Blackmore, and he said, you got asthma, boy? I said, no, sir. No, Sergeant, no. He said, you have? He said, now, when you get an attack... Put your hand up, and I'll tell the team just to hit you on the back of the hit me on the on the back with a pickaxe head on the back of my pack, and it, it cleared it, and that was it. Because they could have thrown me out, but it was brilliant. Yeah, lucky one. Get a lot of youngsters approach me, and they've got some health issues, and they're like, "Chris, you know, what do I do?" And I say, "Look, I can't advise you, but if it was me joining up again." I wouldn't tell him. I wouldn't tell him. No, I did. You know. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, I wouldn't have got in if I'd been if I'd said I had asthma. But he recognised it. You see, so yeah. Good luck to him. Yeah, and you were saying you um, reading your bit about the endurance course. Yes, my yes. old my old nemesis. What a bastard that officer was! Because I failed it the first time. You've only got one more chance. And uh, Captain Ash, Ginger Air, ran me right the way round. Coming back, he says, you've got five minutes. I actually had 15. I, I fucking collapsed at the end of it. But I had 15 minutes. And I looked at him. I said, he said, well, you got round. You're all right. <laughs> yes. Yes. And what was it? What was it? You went to 4-2. Again, we went to the same first unit. 4-2, I went. And um, we went to Canada because I was too young to go to Ireland. I was only just 17. And that, that was the start of two years of sexual abuse, mate, in my room. Yeah. And then he tried to pimp me out in Florida. And then I took one of these blokes apart and he never touched me again. Blimey. Yeah. That's the thing, isn't it? People tend to hero worship the forces and they, they, yeah. just, they don't know the half of it, do they? No, it's, it's just that why Jamie brought all this out was he said, because from here on, you were really, you, and you still are to a point, a really angry young man. And this is why, because everyone I trusted fucked me over. Mm. I had to fight back. So this guy then, was he ever prosecuted? Did, did... No, no. No, I, I buried it for 50 years, Chris. I didn't even tell my wife. If Jamie brought it out. I, I, I put it right back in time. Yeah. So it, yeah, it was either a six-month break when I told him about that one. <laughs> this uh, corporal didn't get punished no um and yeah again it's it, it we were saying when we people hero worship the forces they don't realize that people in the forces are just human 
you know, yeah. and and it, and a take a broad spectrum of life. So you get you get some really good good people, and you get some bad people, don't you? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I, but the thing is, you've got no one to talk to. Yeah, especially when you're you're that young, the pressure on you. You, I, I mean, you you. If you were to speak out, you're I'd have been thrown out. Yeah, or you're just gonna get yeah, you're just gonna get bullied by the rest of the we're not yeah. ma- 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 maybe not always, but it, it's hard, isn't it? When you're you're what, like sixteen or seventeen? Yeah. Um to speak out about about a grown man, it, it's a difficult thing to do. Mm. Very much. Did you do any Norways in the no. <laughs> that's the reason I joined Special Forces, mate. I was in 4-5 after the... Um, uh, I went on ships. And, yeah, I took I took the HMS Daily to siege for Sorry, 24 tell hours. Us. Hey, tell us more. Oh, <laughs> I got a girl pregnant in Plymouth. And I went with her to get an abortion. I think I was about 18, 19. And I came back on board and this leading seaman, I went to the heads. He's washing his hands. And he said, where have you been? You've been with that slut. And the red mist came tumbling down. So he wore the two taps and split his head open. And I just left him and I went and got my top bunk. About half an hour later, I was woke up on the floor with the duty watch round me, saying, come on upstairs, or up top. That's what I did. And Lieutenant Blackmore, big six and a half foot, who was stood there. And I said, sir, what, what am I doing up here? He said, you're waiting for the shore patrol to come and arrest you for serious assault. I said, I fucking ain't. And I hit him with the stool the bosun stool. Then I went down, I ran down to get back to the mess deck and there's about half a dozen Marines on there and uh, this guy grabbed hold of me so I pulled him and he went down and hit the, uh, the metal hatch, got in the mess deck and they sent the Sergeant Major in, told him to fuck off. But while I was there, I amassed Marlin Spike's Tins of, you remember the old puss of tins of jam? Two yeah. pound tins of jam, them, all on this fridge in the corner. And they had a really narrow gap to get into the mess deck. And of course, the boys on the bunks were just pissing themselves. <laughs> Come on, Taff, you can do it. So some major came in, I threw him out. The Lieutenant RM came in, I threw him out. Then the fleet RSM and everyone that came was getting thrown these things up. And the fleet RSM came in then. And he sat, he actually let him in the mess there. He said, right. He said, now, why don't you go make a cup of coffee and we'll talk about this. I said, you think I'm fucking stupid. I go out there, I'm going to get hit. I said, so you now, matey, I've got 10 seconds to get out of my mess deck. Otherwise, these are getting lobbed at you. So he said, he said, well, you're going to get two years for this, you know, don't you? and thrown out. I said, look, you're fucked. Because I, I really, I had no reason whatsoever. So they had the big guns sent in the Legs Diamond, who was massive head of shore patrol in Plymouth Dockyard. But he had to bend over to come into the mess deck. So I picked the fridge up. He was so big and hit him on the head. And they dragged him out. You see his head moving out of the thing. So they dragged him out. And then the Sergeant Major came and said, Moy, 6 a.m., dogs, gas, and lots of people coming to get you out. I said, all right. So 10 to 6, I put my combats on, my berry, packed an overnight bag. And as I walked up the step, up the gangway, up onto the, the flight deck, there was a fucking helicopter. There was lights and dogs. I said, well, I'll come quietly if it's Royal Marine 
police that I have. And these two RM came in. So we the Citadel. Yeah, it was good fun. Jeez. What ship were you on? Hazardous Daily. Um, okay, what was that? Like a destroyer or something? Um, a frigate. Frigate, yeah, frigate. Yeah. Yes. Did you get any good runs ashore, Ben? Uh, yeah, quite a few. Yeah, 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 yeah. Went to uh, Puerto Rico, around the West Indies. Wow. Yeah. Yes. And now I've got 90 days DQs. Let's take the DQs first, and we'll talk about your trips, because um, I was on Invince for a year. Oh, and that's, HMS, a, I, that, that's HMS Invincible for friends at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that one. We, we joined forces with uh, Stan at Fortland. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, sorry, going back to what was DQs like? Um, well... Uh, Captain Brian Uthway loved the Marines. So he came to me and said, look, in the, in the prison, he said, oh, by the way, when they transferred me to Plymouth um, prison on the dockyard, it was legs diving. The one I knocked out who stood there. I thought, shit, I'm going to get the shit kicked out of me now. And he, he said, have you got any problems with me, Edward? So I said, no, not at all. He said, right, come in. We played cards and drank beer all night. So it was great, because that was all right. Um, and Uthwaite said, what you have to do is accept my punishment. Otherwise, it goes to court-martial, and you're going to get out two years in uh, prison, out, and then charged civilian. I said, okay, I'll, yeah. So he gave me 90 days. Yeah, it was good. I was the only Marine in uh, Portsmouth. <laughs> yeah, what 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 sort of stuff do you have to? What what's your cell like? Oh, it's just just like a little bare painted brick cell with a dustbin, a zinc dustbin that we have to polish every fucking night for inspection. And uh, but they they see again. I was in the dining room. There was a huge queue, so I just sat down. I got me me condiments, me salt, pepper, put on the table, and sat down. And this Matlow came up and she said, what the fuck are you doing, Royal? I went, I'm waiting for the queue. He said, you don't sit down till I fucking tell you. And I saw this blur and this fucking Royal Marine, he was an ex-boxing champion, colour sergeant, grabbed this Matlow, slammed him against the wall. He said, you don't touch a Royal, he's mine. And that was it. I got left alone all for 90 days. God, I did one night in DQs. After getting arrested on the <laughs> on the beer, that yeah. was, that was enough. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, do you have to do fitness and stuff in there? You know, e yeah, every day, mate. It was, it was, yeah, it was a long. I was the fittest I've ever been, and the only time I've ever given up smoking because the ball sweets were better. So I'd have got one cigarette after your meal or three ball sweets. <laughs> <laughs> and the blue liners, you couldn't get any smoke out of them anyway. You said. I came to leave. You're allowed in, in the range, you're allowed to choose any draft you want. So I chose to go back to HMS Daily. And they said, You can't. I said, I fucking can. You tell me any draft. So they rang Uthway. He said, Yeah, I'll have him back. So I went back on the ship. Wow. Yeah. Brilliant. Loved it. Love ships. Yeah. Did you get issued cigarettes back then? Yes, blue liners. Yeah. Which were packed like wood. We used to get the beer. We, we could have two cans of beer a day. That's it. Yep, same. So we used to save them up. We used to hot, hot well, <laughs> stash them underneath the chair, underneath the, but whatever you call things. those cushion chair things in the, in the mess. Yeah. Like so, sofas, but they're not really sofas, are they? <laughs> but we used to lift the cushions up and store our beer. And, every, and at the well, weekend... We did, we, we did that, Chris, and we got this big, uh, you know, the big uh, jerry cut, the big um, fannies, the big tins. We poured all sorts of spirit and beer in that, got shit-faced, and we shaved our heads. 
in a Mohican with our fucking knives. <laughs> that's what I, that's the picture I saw. Saw it. Yeah. It's well, I was book, absolutely it? pissed doing that. Yeah. And that was Brian Luthwaite. He said, oh, take your berries off, shave your head. We've got two weeks stoppage of leave then. All right. Till I agree back. I just wanted to find a picture. Hang on a sec. Yeah, for our friends at home, I don't know if you can. Uh... <laughs> yes. Me, Mick Green, Mitch, and Lester Piggott. That's the boys in that picture. And yeah, you were saying, we were saying about Runner Shores, weren't we? What, what ones did you? Do you say Puerto Rico? Puerto Rico, that was um, oh, that was brilliant because we we played rugby against the Navy US Navy SEALs, and after it we had a party on the beach. They had the big uh, bins full of beer, ice cold beer, and they said, "Let's swim across to this little island." So we did. Um, they started doing the theme of Jaws. And of course, when I get nervous, I, I giggle. And I'm taking in water. And we get to the other side. I said, why do you start seeing Jaws? He said, because this is called Barracuda Bay. I said, you what? He said, it's full of them. <laughs> I thought, shit, we have to swim back. Pissed. <laughs> so we did. Yes. Did you beat them at the, at the what was it, rugby? Yeah, we, we had Tiger Beer on the line at half time. They were doing their sprints and warm ups, and we were drinking beer and having a fag, and we still beat our skill. Hey, that's where the Navy SEALs are going wrong, you see. It's not enough beer and fag. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, how, how does somebody get into 14 in then? What, 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 how was that progression for you? Well, I went up to four or five, didn't like the ski training. And there's a note on the little, little tiny bit of paper on the notice board saying, if you'd like to wear your hair long, civilian clothes, and work on your own, please apply. So I put my name down. About half a dozen names went down. And then I'm literally Sunday morning, towel around my waist and flip flops. So I said, somebody needs, wants to see you in the guard room. I went, oh, this is some little bloke with a bowler hat. I went, what the fuck's that? So I went, I went down the guard room. He said, uh, you Marine Evers? Yeah. He said, uh, recently out of DQs and HMS Daily. I said, yeah. He said, well, I'd like to chat to you about your, your application. So we had a long chat. He said, well, you do seem like the sort of bloke we need for an undercover unit. And uh, so I joined. Uh, 1,500 applied. 80 got on the course. And seven passed. Wow. But I was no super fit man. I was, I was, I think I'm, I'm pretty much psychologically damaged, to be honest. And I don't, when, when my mind's made up, I don't give a shit what anyone throws at me, Ever. And the big as they are, as many as they are, doesn't mean a toss to me. So they they really, and I, I like to keep people's morale up. So I was the joker. And my training number, unfortunately, was seven, seven, seven. <laughs> so I did not get picked on for the sevens. Better than, six, better than six, six, six. Yeah, 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 yeah. That probably suits me more. Yeah. Um. What and what training do you do? Because I, I mean, I honestly have no idea. So for friends at home, we're talking about fourteen int. So I'm guessing that's the what the fourteenth intelligence unit. Right. Its first name was SIU, and even the name secret intelligence unit was top secret no one was allowed to say the, the name of it nobody had no one we knew knew where we were we weren't allowed to phone or or 
right unless it was all censored. Um, yeah, they, they took it very seriously. And we did the, the SAS selection to start with. I, I believe we did and talked to friends since we did. And then you were taken to a little camp where you learned all the recognition and uh, uh, observation post skills. And it was about five months. And, uh, you know, one that even lot, he, he got, used to go back into your room and beds would be empty. And all, all you went for was a tap on the shoulder, which meant you're finished. And they did it, you know, they, we did million one day and they lined us up, no gloves, head to head, roughly the same size. And you had three minutes to beat the shit out of each other. So we did. Some people gave up, went. And the next day they said, right, line up again, we'll do million again. And 13 blokes walked. He said, oh, sorry, no, that was yesterday. We're doing murder ball. And they all turned around and they said, no, you've gone, go. So it was all, it was, it was really sort of psychological as well as physical. Um, but yeah, yeah, I got through. Mm. And yeah, so friends at home, so 14 in then is the undercover guys and girls, I'm guessing, that, that operate well, I suppose around the world, but back in our day, it, it was the Northern yeah. Ireland conflict. Purely Northern Ireland then. Yeah. What 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 sort of tasks could you expect to do? It was mainly surveillance, um, unless it turned into a conflict, and then you you know exactly what happens then. Um, but we would house people. We would have a, we had a code a code book. Um, with all the terrorists and code, code names. Now, Salmon 1, sorry, Trout 1 was Jerry Adams. Alpha 11 was Martin McGuinness. And he was in charge of Derry. And he was the main man. I mean, there's, there's lots of things in the book. Um, but the, the one that frightens me the most, or two actually, one was to find an IED, an improvised explosive device, which had been hidden under the flyway in Derry, a flyover. And they were being used to put into shops in Belfast, incendiary, on a timer. When people had gone home, up they went. So I had to find it. So I found it after a bit of looking, and me and Blue, I put it in my pocket took it to a little car park about half a mile away, opened the boot, opened it, and took photographs of it because each one is wired to a certain person. It's like a signature. And then put it back. And when I think of it now, I'm, you know, I could have my balls blown off. But yeah. Yeah, they used to, for the timers, they used to use all sorts of weird stuff, didn't they? Yep, yep. You could buy them like in bulk, this certain kind of top. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, over the years, I'm guessing everything's been used from egg timers to watches to, in recent times, obviously mobile phones. And, and um, but I remember when we were over there, there was a specific time, type of timer. You bought it like wholesale, you could buy thousands of them, yeah. I'm guessing. And yeah, uh, there was a guy in Belfast. One of the IRA players was called Toasty Flynn. And they called him Toasty because he'd blown all his all his face off. He, he, <laughs> bomb, bomb had gone off, you know, he was a bomb mate, bomb maker, obviously, and he'd um one had detonated in his face, and so they, his nickname was Toasty. I don't know if the IRA nicknamed him that or whether it was just the, the British, <laughs> British forces, but probably yeah, serious old business. And um, yeah, tell us more, Martin. What you know? Did you did you get in any scrapes? Um, yeah, the the one. I mean, all the, the reason I put Ultimate Survivor on this is because I probably had more lives than the cat would have. One particular one was in the Cregan, 
we were told there's um, an arms stash in the school, in the loft. So we did a recce. We came back, uh, got MI6 involved because we were going to bug it. Um, so, but we did that. And as we were going back to check, what we, we found, we, we found a, uh, a bunch of old shotguns in the loft and a suitcase. The suitcase was full of documents signed by McGuinness. And there were 30 death warrants. Those documents came back with us. MI6 photographed um, one of the steps of the ladder and the stock of one of the rifles. And we went back out, photographed all the documents sent to London and heard nothing. So we went, we went back in, but on the way in, we were like silhouetted. And to get through the window of the school, we, we had to have this uh, homemade appliance, which looked a little bit like a machine gun. So little Aki's carrying this, and all we heard was this halt. Now, fucking luckily, it was a Yorkshire accent. Where we operated, the, the army in that area were told, do not go in there. The boys are operating, which we were the boys. This bloke obviously thought boyos, which is the IRA. So he decided to pop an ambush on us. And the MI6 bloke went for his pistol. And luckily, he fucking left it in the camp. He left it there. So we got through that. We had to go back. We had to pull out for a few months. But we went back in with MI6 and put the... He brought these two things up. Fantastic. And they was completely bugged from then on. So we had the transcripts of the IRA and the movement of the weapons. And they actually got the movements on the tilt switch to stop. So, yeah, we, we, we got a few good wins. The bloke that made the IED, we caught. And that was from housing him to staking him out. It was my first OP. About seven days eating uh, crackers and gold sausages. Uh, no hot drinks, nothing. And, yeah, we, we, we housed him, trapped him, associates to a building site where it was a poor cabin. And that was the bomb factory. You got 12 years. Blimey. Yeah. A lot of work. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of work. Yeah, I bet. Did you see much death over, over there? Uh, my mate, unfortunately, got ambushed and shot Jay. Um, and even that is another life because we were both getting married on the same day in, in March. So we went to... Uh, call Rain to get our suits. On the way back, he started pissing down. I said, I don't fancy this OP this tonight. And Jay said, well, I'll do it. Because the other guy was his mate from the Paras, who was ex-Para. I was the only Marine there, or ex-Marine. And uh, so he did it. And they got they got done. And he, he died, bless him. I was in control. Are you able to tell us a bit more what actually happened? Because... Well, what, what happened was that there was there were two two terrorists that were living underground. Well, they came out at night. Um, they positioned the OP to cover this area. And they saw the two figures coming. And you've got to bear in mind that the army are told to keep out, so that it's not going to be army. But they've got camouflage suits on and rifles. Now, I personally would have just shot them. Quite simple. Unfortunately, the guy with Jay, and I won't mention his name because he was a call he made, actually followed the yellow book. I said, halt, halt. And on the second halt, they sprayed him with rounds. And as he went down, he sprayed Francis Hughes and caught him on the legs. But he made a call, you know, whether right or wrong, it's, it's, it's his call. I was an authorised call. So, anyway, we found Francis Hughes in the, in the bushes, and that's, I've got a sort of rose gallery of this, and he died on hunger strike. 
Tony Diamond got away and was never never caught. Jay, unfortunately, they're both on the same injuries. The, the bullets have gone through their stomach, but Jay's have gone through his pistol and taken a lot out. So I literally sat with him as he died in the hospital. It was, yeah, because I was on control. Because you have one operator doing the radio to call people in if the shit hits the fan, and the two operators. And unfortunately, yeah, he died, bless him. Yeah. Yeah, it's a serious end of the stick, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. What, um, what did you do after the detachment? Um, <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna go back in the Marines until I was interviewed by a sergeant major that called me a fucking cowboy, and I was going back to Derry as a Royal Marines. And I went, "You have a laugh, mate? Not a chance." Sorry, that was before. It's about a week, a, a month before, right? I said no. So when I went back, I was all bravado. Now, this is where I followed McGuinness into a shop. Because you get all cocky, don't you? At the end of your tour, nothing can touch me. My mate had been killed. I have survived. So I'm doing a foot follow through Derry. And McGuinness, he walked into this shop. So I walked in. And he wasn't there. The shop was just like a front room of a house. So I picked up a packet of chewing them, 220, grunted. And I turned around, McGuinness in a little alcove on the phone. He said, gotcha. Yeah, that's when you know adrenaline's brown. And I ran. Going black. And I got picked up when we went. Yeah, that was that was a scary moment, that one. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, bless him. When we were there, it was... Um the buzz was that McGuinness was the, in charge of all importing all the drugs into Belfast. Yep. Because they had this thing, didn't they? The IRA would act as uh, the local police for the anti-sort of drugs trade. That oh, yeah, absolutely. So, again, for friends listening, when you, you hear about these kneecappings, a lot of them were, were teenagers that were caught smoking a bit of dope that yes. I, I, I don't know if they got a warning or what, and if it's like second time unlucky, but they take him in an alleyway. In fact, they wouldn't even take, they, they tell them to turn up at this certain time in an alleyway. And the youngster or whoever it was who'd wronged, wronged the IRA would just have to turn up. Some of them would wear shorts. So, when they got shot, the, the, the wound wouldn't get infected with, with cloth and, and cause a nightmare for the surgeon to take the yeah. cloth out. And so they turn up there, you know, roll their trouser legs up, roll their sleeves up and get shot through the elbows and the knees. And, and that was the IRA, uh, you know, a big part of that was the IRA, their, yeah. their anti, anti-substance use stance, can we say, at the same time as the IRA were importing all the drugs. <laughs> in- they, they were, and the cabs were their transport. Yes. But they yes. owned the cabs. Heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those cabs were up to a lot of no good, weren't they? Well, some of them, let's say. Absolutely. We saw that when the signalers were shot, didn't we, that, that the um, taxis blocked their car in. Did you did you know anything about those guys? Was it called? Yes, the, the, the two the two guys that got because we we had a reunion just after that. I was in tears because they were two um, admin guys. Had they been operators, they'd have killed half of them people and got away. But they were admin guys, and they'd taken the wrong turn at a funeral. Yeah, and they were butchered. Yeah, okay, yeah, that was really sad. But, you know, rules are rules. Don't do it. Yeah, Corporal Howes and Corporal Wood. That was just savage, wasn't it? It was awful. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's why, you know, and some things I can't say and, and not in the book, what what we did over there is quite or quite justified. Whatever happens to any of them. Well, that... That was 88, so that's the year that we went out there, right? 
Yeah. Uh, in fact, no, we went 89. So this was 88. So we're opening up the newspapers back here and all over the mainstream media was the helicopter footage of these two guys. Yeah. You saw them accidentally drive into this funeral. That you, you just saw a car. Obviously, you didn't know. Yeah. You know, they didn't know at the time. And the car just shot into this funeral. Then it appeared to panic and try to reverse out but by that time the locals or the taxi drivers had clicked summons not right about this and they drove to block them off didn't they and then yeah lots of strange stuff there's a one close-up image you could see the magazine dropping out of one of their browning nine mils because they weren't trained chris yeah they reckon that he'd he'd gone to take the safety catch but hit the you know, drop the clip. Yeah, see, uh, they're, they're pure admin. They don't do any training at all. Yeah. And they just drive. They, they used to pick us up from the airport. Of course, we would be the backup. Um, whenever we went on leave, they'd drive us. But they had the long hair as well, you see. But unfortunately, they weren't. Yeah, gosh. Just awful. It's just, yeah. just, yeah, awful, awful. So, tell us, what, what happened? Did you leave when they asked you to go back in the Marines then? What happened? Did you, is that when you put well, your... Well, he, he, he basically said, I'm a cowboy and what have you. But the, 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 the head of... It, Colonel Ian Campbell, the head of the uh, 22 SAS at the time, actually got that bloke sacked. That's not major. Because he was a failed operator, basically. Um. So we went, we went back and had a stag do for, uh, sorry, a wake instead of a stag do for, the, for Jay. And a Marine, a very, very strong, big, tough Marine, we thought, went running out into the compound. And so I said, that's, that's not right. And he was going into his boot and he got his rifle out. Oh, fucking, everyone was pissed. And I know he had got, put a bit of spoil on to make it automatic. And he he pulled it out. I'm going to kill the bastard. And I grabbed all the barrel and Dave, um, uh, Dave Op, I grabbed the barrel and he put it right in my mouth, <laughs> right next to my mouth. And as Dave pulled it, he fired. It was straight through the dining room. Just cracked up, mate. Just totally lost it. So he was stripped and put in the room and taken away and returned to unit. But he was a he was a SPS, yeah, but couldn't take it. But after we found, he hadn't actually been where he said he'd been on the ground when we were looking for backup. He'd been hiding. So he, you know, and these big tough soldiers, but the head takes over. Yeah. I bet you were fearless, weren't you? <laughs> well, that, somebody uh, die another operator. At days, they died of cancer last year, unfortunately. Um, actually, wrote, read it out of the funeral. What a hero his dad was, his uh, his mate uh, Dave was, um, and they all they all just thought, yeah, that's Dave Bruin. Dave Bruin. Yeah, he was. He was. He did about three tours. Uh, lovely guy. But yeah, save your life. What comes next then? What, was that your bodyguard, your bodyguard instant, or is I there tried more? to join the place, and I got through. And then John Alderton, the the guy with the beard, God, in Manchester, because that's where I went to join. Um, not me back. Tried to appeal, couldn't. So then I went to Devon. I laboured on a building site for two years. Lived in a caravan. Um, Can we just, uh, j- just, just for our friends at home, let, let's just highlight there, this is, this is an issue that service personnel face. It, oh, yeah. We've we got Martin here, who's, who's special forces operator, tr- entrusted to, you know, carry a weapon under his jacket and... and have the the um, 
you know, the wherewithal to know when to discharge it and, and et cetera, et cetera. And then you come out of the forces and you can only get a job on a building site. And we've, yep. we've, all, we've all been there, haven't we? Yep. Yep. Then I was, I was offered a job by an ex-commander of Special Forces in London doing bodyguarding. So that's what I did for uh, a guy called Prince Banda bin Sultan, who was the defence minister for Saudi in America. Um, yeah, did that for a while. Any then, uh, any exciting moments there? No, no. Well, <laughs> carrying his bags. Well, no, the only exciting moment was when his daughter, who was seven, ran down the hotel corridor, into the lift, down into the grand ballroom and lifted her, her nighty up. And I gave her a slap. Oh, crikey. Yeah, I knew he lost my He said, you never touch. I said, she was throwing a fanny all around the, the door. Yeah, that was about the only seven in that, that, that one job. Mm. Yeah. And... Um- would you agree that working on a building site in winter is one of the hardest things a man hey, can do? I loved it. I, I, one of the Italian guys that worked there come at me with a knife once because I was showing him up. I was sprinting with bags of cement. I was down to 11 and a half stone. I've still got pictures of it now. And it was, I loved every minute of it. I was super fit. Super tired when I go home to go to sleep. Because I don't sleep. I do about two, three hours now a night. And that's it. But, yeah, I loved every minute of it, mate. Honestly. £32 a week. I I was a bit the same. You know, when you have to stack out the blocks and you just, you start off picking up one and then you, then you pick, and then next thing you're like picking three breeze blocks up at the same time. But we used to have to chisel them apart because the frost would stick them together. <laughs> and I used to did wonder where my life was going at that point. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, I was rescued. I was definitely yes. rescued. It's funny, isn't it, how you can be yeah. on the bones of your ass not knowing what the hell's going on and then at a different point in your life, you're in a completely different place. Yeah. yeah. So we, went to, we went to a bed sit there in London we lived in. And every time an IRA bomb went off, they had a party because it was owned by IRA sympathisers. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in the room going, uh, uh, uh. yeah. Yes. What, um, so how did you start making money then? Because it, it sounds like a, from, from being well, on a building site to being a multimillionaire. Well, I went, I went to Washington as a bodyguard, um, threatened the black. Uh, sorry, he threatened his, his, his cousin because he was beating the black housekeeper. So I got sacked from that. Then I went to Uganda as a mercenary and came out of the coup. Very luckily came out of the coup. Um, across land with no weapons. Well, that's, that's in the book. Leave, leave some, for someone to read. <laughs> yeah. Um, then I went to contract security, basically, Chris, and Got a lot of contacts. And the, the, the one guiding force behind all of this is my wife, Teresa. And we were sat there one day and she said, you need to start on your own. I said, no, nah, I can't. We went, sorry, where's the post office? That is a, uh, a comedy series on its own. <laughs> you were op- opening a post office? Yeah, I, I went to... Ran a post office in Devon for four and a half years. Otterton. I heard about that, yes. Um, bad luck having to come to Devon. Apologise about that. <laughs> um, if I was at own a post office, I probably would have robbed it back in my younger younger days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so and how did you go from a post office then to where you are now? Well, I did the contract stuff and then... I borrowed £40,000 to build an extension to my bungalow. And it was when they changed the rules. You didn't have to give... Usually when you borrowed money from a building site, you had to give all the invoices from the builders and the quotes. 
They said, no, you don't need that anymore. You can do what you like with it. And Teresa said, start on your own, out the garage. And I did. I would cut a long story short, 17 years, 17 years later, I, I was turning over 80 million with two and a half thousand people. My gosh. D sorry, yep. do it, doing what? Doing what at Contract oh. security on the Shard, Tower 42, City Point. I only took big buildings, Lloyd's. So how did you feel then when Matey Boy gets up there with his parachute on and base jumps off? As long as my guards haven't let him on, that's fine. The one on the shard actually went through the railway because the station owns a third of that perimeter. So not guilty, Your Honour. OK. Because <laughs> I've seen a few of those videos. Yeah. Which I'd like to get that lad on. If anybody knows that guy I'm on about, get him on my podcast. <laughs> he gets around all the security he gets yeah. up to these buildings in London and him and, him and maybe his mate jump off um, but what, yeah, I, yeah I actually sold three four years ago and I gave I, I got 20 million I gave 10 away to family and staff 5 million purely to the staff that helped me do it and the accountant said, I don't know anyone else that would have done this. I wrote all a handwritten letter, because if you do that, they don't get the tax. It's a gift. And I yeah, wrote £5 million worth of checks. Blimey. <laughs> well, mate, they deserved it. Mm. And what can I do with 20? I can't do with 10. Yes. I'm only a, an ordinary guy, you know. Yeah, of course. How... How's the book been doing? Um, I don't know, really. They don't keep in contact with me. <laughs> Welcome to the world of uh, writing. Publishers, yeah. yes. We're, I've, I've, um, I've been through it. I've been through it all. I, I tell about the book of my car, Chris. Oh, well done. I cost people in the streets. <laughs> yes. Probably going to um, cost you more money to do that than you'll make. <laughs> Did you, um, you know, how, how do you how do you go about getting a book together? Then did you have help with it, or do you? Do you... It was Jamie Jamie Hogg. The what happened was I, I've got a house in, in on the Dales, and across the road there was a guy called Alan who used to look after it for me, and I told him a few war stories. He said, "Well, my son is a ghostwriter." And he just finished Brian Blessed. And he said, tell me three stories. So I told him three. He said, have you got any more? I said, loads. He said, right, I'm going to sit down with it. It took two and a half years to write. Yeah, we should thank Jamie because I, well, I, I, spoke, to, yeah, I spoke to him on the phone to get, to get your number and um, very, very nice chat. He is also the one I go to when I get depressed because I, I do suffer a lot with uh, dark places and uh, usually I will go and see my grandchildren that, and Sophia just lights me up um, if I'm really bad I'll just text Jamie and he'll, he'll know and we'll have a chat uh, mm. yeah but he's, he's yeah he's a good boy yes so to finish off we were going to talk weren't we uh, about overcoming overcoming abuse um I, I what i want to angle at here and i'm i want to be careful martin because yeah. what works for one might not work for another but we do live in a society where i believe we're purposely destroyed from birth with respect to developing what i would call a spiritual self you know a connection with something yeah. that's much, much bigger than us what maybe yeah. some people want to call God or whatever. And I believe these psychopathic trillionaires that own and control everything are really clever at cutting us off from that. And I also think that they like to see us suffer. They don't like to see us get over stuff. This is why we live in a culture where rather than 
you know, people have become so damaged that when they have an issue, they wear it like it's a badge of honor, you know, mm. like, hey, I'm an abuse this, I'm a, and, and, yeah. And well, I just think yeah. it, 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 it's like a negative start because what I say is there's, you know, it's all experiences. If you can get to love the person you are now, yeah. you, you've got a great life. Like, a, for example, you know, if you've got a beautiful family, yeah, you couldn't have this if you hadn't gone through this life experience when it was good, when it was bad. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's right to hurt or abuse people. No, of course, not, not, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is if we can learn t- to learn by it, and then well, leave it, the, leave it, leave it in the past, and move on. Well, that's, that's basically. Um, people say, "Was it therapeutic?" Writing the book? No, I pushed all that away. Mm. I never, I hardly ever thought about it then. But all, all I'll say is that that me and Trees have tried to give our children, and have succeeded. What we never had, which was a close, where siblings looked after siblings. I mean, my brother committed suicide. Um, in whole prison because my father threw him out. Um, he hung himself and I had to go and, you know, do the body. My two cousins committed suicide. So I, that's inherent. And there's some in my family as well. In my children mm. have suffer. My, I'm Bryn did Afghan as a Marine and he lost a good buddy and he suffers. You know, so, but I will, I will never give up on them where back in the day, you know, if you were depressed, whether it be drugs, you know, you're, you're out. Fuck off, you miserable bastard. Get out. But it, that's not what it is. Mm. And I've, there's one thing I always, and if anyone takes anything but this, a kind word can save a life. A nasty word can cost one. Because if you're on the edge, the nasty one will send you over and the nice one will just lift you up enough to step back from that train platform or un- undo the noose or put the pills down, you know, and it just people fucking stop being kind to each other. That's all it takes. Don't need therapists. Just everyone looks after each other. It's never going to happen for us, is it? Well, yeah, it, mm, it, it will happen, but first of all, and I'll make no apologies for saying we've got to get rid of these psychopaths that control it. You know, they, they want us to be unhappy. Yeah. We, there's a better way, you know, all we are to them is a birth certificate. Cause that's registered on the stock exchange for, for their fucking weird perverts, but there is a better way and we will get there. This is part of the reason I started the global veterans Alliance is to, is to use a, a, a military uh, approach discipline but in a peaceful way to say yeah. to people to say these guys don't control the show everyone's born beautiful everyone's born perfect everybody's born equal and everyone should experience uh i don't want i say happiness but by happiness what i mean is when it's not going so well you appreciate this life just as much yeah. as when it's going so well. And this is yeah. what they've done. They've done it really clever is they've got people to think when you're facing a bit of a challenge, oh, throw the baby out of the bathwater, nothing's worth, you know, and and it and it's good to get your life in a place where, you know, if I go outside the front door and I watch a juggernaut run over my car, I just fucking could not yeah. give a shit. Honestly. No. I would laugh my ass as long as nobody yeah. was hurt. I'd laugh my ass off. Yeah. Whereas what we've got is a society where that yeah. will be one of the worst things in people's lives that they're going to piss their pants about and cry like a bitch. Yeah. And I'm not criticizing the person now. I'm saying I'm, you know, and and we need to lead people into the light and in in in, yeah. in to get balance and happiness in their lives and to. Priority. Be nice to one person every day, Chris. That's mm. all people have to do, and they'll take away any power of anybody. 
because they haven't yeah. got power. It's all nice, and every, you love everyone, loves you. That's it. Done. Yeah. And it's not rocket science, is it, mate? No, it's not. And and like you said, I always say you're either somebody that pulls people away from suicide yeah. or you're a person that pushes people towards it. There's no, yeah. there isn't a middle ground. Nope. And what we're seeing at the minute is a military uh, um, crisis in mental health. The suicides are through the roof. I know. And yet you've got thoughtless service personnel on, on, on their keyboards still giving fellow service people shit. I know. And not understanding that you are, you know, you are the problem. Because you can get over trauma, you can get over bad experiences, yes, you, can. You, you can get over what happened in Afghanistan. You you can, but you can't do it when you've got some fucking knobhead yeah. going nah, 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 nah. And, and 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 it's it's ah. and sadly, by nature of the psychological makeup of a lot of military personnel, they they can be the worst for it. Not not all of them. There's some beautiful military people out there, veterans. Yeah, there are. But there's also some real wankers, aren't there? <laughs> I've decked a few of them. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you ain't got no, something nice to say, just just, just no. shut up and fuck off. Shut. Yep, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Martin, yeah. listen, this has been brilliant. Viva la revolution! <laughs> yes. Yes, it's coming, but it will be a peaceful one and it will be yes. on, our, on our terms, not 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 these idiots. No. Um, brother, it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, I can't wait to dive into your book and then we'll get you back on the show again because I'll have a load more questions for you then. All right, mate. But... Um, Martin, just stay on the line while I click the record button off. Then, then I can okay. thank, thank you properly. Then I can. Then I'm going to proposition you, but not not in that, <laughs> not not in that respect, because I know. I'll just take my shorts off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get. I don't want to get knocked out here. But um, you're corporal. Oh, hang on! You disappeared. Is someone trying to call you. Low battery. Ah, uh, okay. All right, in that case, I'll pick up the phone to you. To our friends at home, massive love to you all. Thank you so much for, for um, tuning into the podcast. It's been an absolute... Um, oh, there we go. Yeah. Yep. It's been an absolute uh, brilliant one. Martin, thank you ever so much again. My pleasure, sir. Friends, could you like and subscribe and hit the notifications bell? And could you just check, friends, that you're subscribed because YouTube just subscribes pe unsubscribes people from this channel um, in, in, in their droves, which is pretty unfair, but it's just one of those, you know, you, I guess they've got their favourite channels and the channels that speak the truth too, too much. Anyway, I'm out of here. See you all soon.